Grant us, Lord, not to be anxious about earthly things, but to love things eternal. And even now, while we are placed among things that are passing away, to hold fast to those that shall endure. Amen. Amen. So how about this passage from the Gospel of Luke this morning, huh? You know, I have read a number of biblical commentaries trying to sort this out. And they all seem to be in agreement that this passage with the parable of the unjust or the shrewd or the dishonest manager depending on the translation that you use, that this passage is one of the hardest to understand. Going all the way back to St. Augustine. One commentary actually suggested that we might want to consider having a hymn sing today <laughs> instead of a sermon. <laughs> Very tempting for all of us, I know. So at some point, we will have a hymn sing, but not today. So hold on to that. In Luke's gospel, this parable follows immediately after the parables of lost things that we had last week. Only this parable, Luke tells us, Jesus directs to the disciples he no longer seems to be speaking to the religious leaders. So these words are for the disciples about discipleship and for the crowds who have been following along with them. And we hear, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth. That doesn't sound like the Jesus that we know the Jesus who time and again warns us about the dangers of our riches becoming an idol, who says it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, and who tells us that we must give up all our possessions to become his disciple. And just a few verses after this strange advice, he warns us that no slave can serve two masters, that we cannot serve both God and wealth. So why then does Jesus tell us to make friends for ourselves by means of dishonest wealth? Well, <clears throat> The word translated as shrewd here, and speaking of the manager's actions, means prudent, wise, sensible, practical, pragmatic. And the manager, acting shrewdly, takes on a role that is fairly common in literature and more common in the Bible than we might think. He's a trickster, a trickster who often seems to be at a disadvantage, but who is savvy and clever. And those qualities can prove to be more valuable at times than other assets, helping the trickster to triumph over the person who seemed to be the sure bet. We can think of David and Goliath. David beats Goliath because David cleverly figures out how to use his resources to his advantage. Or Jacob and Rebecca, who are tricksters who deceive Isaac to get Esau's birthright from him. And in such stories, the hero is one who is clever, and again, uses that to take a hold of blessings to ensure a good future, and even to take away some power from those who seem to be in charge. 
they are not quite models of moral behavior. But clearly, the scriptures have a place for these figures. And Jesus says we might just have something to learn from them. And if parables ask us to look at things such as how should we live our lives, then perhaps one thing this parable is telling us is that we need to be as wise, as shrewd as this manager in our discipleship, that it is important to do our best with what we have been given. And perhaps this strange parable is also telling us that we need to be smarter, smarter when it comes to confronting the powers that be in this world. Jesus' audience of mostly lower class people here would have paid careful attention to parables that started with, there was a rich man. And sometimes when we feel that we are without power to speak out against injustice in the world, we feel helpless. And that helplessness can paralyze us but Jesus' parable, and indeed the whole stories of the tricksters in scripture, those stories of those who shrewdly find ways to turn the tables, even on those who seem to hold all the cards, that perhaps they are reminders to us that if we are shrewd, if even children of the light can learn to be smart with the tools that God gives us, that there is no power greater than God and no power that can keep us from seeking to love and serve God and to love and serve our neighbor. Luke's gospel contains several parables where it is someone with less power who helps a person of higher status. It is the person who appears to have less power who actually provides a path forward. And another mark of the parables in Luke's gospel is reversals. Reversals. That they are, that it is those who are last, who shall be first, and those who are highly exalted, who shall be humbled. And it is the humble and meek who shall be exalted. And we may just find that it is those whom we thought of as below us, those that we thought of as the ones with less power, that those people are the ones who actually show us the glimpses of God's kingdom here in this life, that we have something to learn. It is easy to get stuck on the aspect of dishonesty in the manager's collections, but maybe that's just the point. Not that we are to be dishonest, but that in spite of it all, through his shrewd actions, when he thought that he had lost it all, that even he can help to bring forgiveness and new life in building up the community and building up the kingdom of God. Although our true riches can only be found in that place where no thief can draw near and no moth destroys, what we do with the resources that we have in this life, at this time, in this place, what we do with all of this matters. By God's grace, may we be such shrewd and wise agents in using whatever we have, 
wherever we find ourselves, to bring new life and balance to our relationships and our communities, and helping to build up the kingdom of God. And I want to give a shout out here to George, to Yana, to Kate and Michael for their lyrics for our very special postlude today. You all just have to hold on to your hats for that. <laughs> I'm not going to give anything else away beyond that, other than saying that in looking at the lyrics, I keep coming back to the line, how do you measure these years at St. Mark's? And again, I won't spoil anything. We will all just have to listen, but I do invite you that when we do get to that point, when we do get to that very special postlude, to please pay particular attention to those words. And what a gift. And as we are reminded by this parable, what we do with the resources we have in this life, at this time and this place matters, and how do you measure these years at St. Mark's? And thank you, George. In our conversations leading up to this Sunday, and in looking at this special piece for our postlude, George had shared with me some notes of wisdom that he had jotted down from a commencement speech, is that correct, that you had heard some years ago. And so, uh, George, with your permission, I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot here, but I'd like to just share a few of those jotted notes. <laughs> because they were just so striking to me at this time in this place as we gather here. And again, with this parable, how do you measure a life? Do you measure it by yesterday or today? Do you measure it by what others have and do or what you do not have or do? Do you measure by what you do or who you are? How do you measure your life? By the dreams imagined or the hopes dashed? By the wisdom of wise words or by the sorrow of silence? by the wealth accumulated, or by the amount spent, by defeat, or by victory, large and small? Do you measure it by the forgotten, or the remembered, by all the near misses and exhaustion, or by the ability to endure? by the friends and family gathered around you, by the support you are offered. How do you measure a life? By God's grace, may we be shrewd and wise and loving in using whatever we have, wherever we find ourselves. May we bring and use all of this for new life and balance in our relationships and our communities in helping to build up this kingdom of God in life beyond all measure. Amen. Amen.